living in Long Island is quite different than living in New York City. We know that this is the extension. It's like Greater New York, we can call it. But Long Island uh, is not an organized area just like New York City. For example, New York City has one board of education and Long Island has so many. Every town has its own. But majority move from New York, uh, from Brooklyn, Queens and small these boroughs to Long Island because they find that in Long Island you can have your own house, you can have a garage or in a, and a driveway and also you can make a right turn on red light. <laughs> I've learned You never really know What's going on What's going on I thought I knew everything What people say in me The everything in between And I spent Two of my time reading between the lines and never feeling quite right well I'm not gonna read no more I seal up the cracks through wide the door I've known and done all along Cause I have found that it's never paid to spend my time seeking out the pain that lingers between the looks and the way Just listen to the words that you hear. What's that you say? So my name is Sonia Aurora, and I've been living in Long Island for about 12 years. I am not from Long Island. I grew up in all different parts of the East Coast, uh, mostly Yonkers, New York. But I was born in India, in Ludhiana, Punjab. And where do you live on Long Island now? In Port Washington, nice. which is on the North Shore of Long Island. Let's see, in 2016, if you'll remember what happened, Trump got elected and we were very concerned about our immigrant neighbors. And I think that's one of the misconceptions of Long Island, that Long Island is this bastion of privilege and the demographics have really changed a lot. Um, and in fact, our district, I would say about a third of the students are Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, 
African American, Asian American, multiracial. So that's pretty significant. We needed to make sure that our immigrant neighbors knew their rights. If ICE came to the door, what would they do? What would they say? How could they get an advocate for themselves? So we worked with some of our local churches, the library. Um, we even had a wonderful immigration lawyer um, offer free legal clinics, Michael Mandel. That's how we got started, and it just grew from there. A lot of the parents said, okay, we know what Trump wants from us. We know that we have to be good citizens, and we've been good citizens. But the reason we came to this country is that we want we want educational equity for our kids. And they didn't say it in so many words, but they said, look, we want our kids to have access to summer camps. We want them to have access to the best programming in our schools. And there was a huge language barrier for a lot of parents. So one of the projects that we started was something called Project Puentes, where we trained some of our local moms to become professional interpreters so that they could offer their interpretation skills to the school district. Then we started working with our school district on educational equity issues, um, making sure that our suspension rates were not so high for our black and Latino boys, um, making sure that we had language access, making sure that we had curriculum that looked, that reflected the diversity of our town. And then my husband's been working on this rewilding initiative where we're transforming, we're encouraging Long Islanders to transform their lawns into native gardens, into wildflower meadows, attracting biodiversity, preventing uh, a lot of loss of water. When I look back, I think, my gosh, we, we really did a lot. And it wasn't just me, it was a community of people. So my name is Julie Lyon. I live in Westbury, which is right in the middle of Long Island, and I've lived here since December of 2009. So I'm, I feel like I'm relatively new to the area, but I, I'm also aware that that's more than 10 years. So. <laughs> Westbury Arts, I'll just give you our mission, is a 501c3 nonprofit whose mission is to develop arts and cultural programs that connect educate and inspire our community. And our vision is a community where arts and culture are valued and instill a sense of belonging and pride. When the mayor put out a call for the Westbury Arts Council, we attended that meeting with the idea that, oh, we're gonna go and hopefully meet other people and get connected with the musical slash artistic community on Long Island. And I remember the first few meetings were a lot of people standing around and talking and I really wanted to be doing something. So I asked the mayor, what can I do? I want, I want to do something. The mayor was like, yeah, you can handle our Facebook page. And, and so that's how it started. And then, I, and then when they had a call for volunteers to be on the board of directors, I signed up and Things progressed from there, and it was not an aspiration of mine. I would have told you that I did not have the, the vision for Westbury Arts to become president, but it, but it has actually blossomed into something that feels very important to me and very personal because, it, because I see how important the arts are in a community, especially the ability of the arts to connect people from different backgrounds who would not normally connect with each other. My name is Adriana Devers. I am originally from Dominican Republic and I have been on Long Island for the past 28 years. I came in 1994 on the 4th of July as a teenager. And so I first arrived in uh, Brentwood, New York, and then I'm here now for a couple of years in the town of Westbury. I am the first vice president of Westbury Arts. I am an author, I'm also an educator, so I kind of try to combine both in bringing meaningful experiences, especially to children and families to really foster the love of uh, learning, uh, of literature. I want children to see themselves reflected in my work. So my, my children's books really uh, express a message of inclusivity, of family diversity and pride in my Hispanic roots. 
I recently published a children's book titled Valentina Valente. She is my dad, ella es mi papá, and it's a bilingual children's book on family diversity and unconditional love. Um, it's a book that I say just came straight from my heart. It's just such a, a beautiful story. The character, my daughter says she looks like her. Other children have told me, oh my gosh, she looks like me. And when I hear those things, it really, you know, it really proves that we are building that connection and that we are engaging children in uh, not only becoming interested in their reading, but also seeing themselves there because as, as you know, representation does matter. The other bigger thing that we have going on is another um, series of works for which we were awarded the SCR grant and that is the, our Be the Color of This World series, which is a series of diversity celebrations. So, so far we've celebrated Black History Month and Women's History Month. We're going into May is Asian Pacific American Heritage Month. And then in June, we'll be in LGBTQIA plus Pride Month. <laughs> and then also, and then the last one in the series is Hispanic Heritage Month. I also recently published a poetry book. Uh, it, that one is in Spanish, Huellas de una Memoria Perdida. So I've been, uh, contemplating and really working and looking forward to translating a lot of the different uh, poems that I have in there to be able to, you know, bring a book now in, in English poetry. A lot of my friends have been asking, so I'm looking forward to that. We'll get started. Sure. So, what is your name? My name is Shahid Ahmad Farooqi. And you can tell me where on Long Island you're from and how many years you've lived here. I'm from Hempstead, and we I'm living with my family and my sister's family in Hempstead from last 10 to 12 years. As Muslim, I am playing my role as a law-abiding citizen, number one. Number two, to cooperate and help uh, agencies, government institutes, helping in educating them. If there is a something I see which is should be corrected, so I call, I ask them, I reach out to mayor's office, reach out to the county executive office. So during this month of Ramadan, which is a month where Muslim in this month fast from dawn to sunset, and uh, in this month uh, we. Uh, also, majority of Muslims uh, spend their time in mas in their mosque by um, per performing their rituals, their daily prayers, but also they distribute food to to homeless, to needy. I made a box where I put some information about Ramadan and Islam and Muslim, and also some candy, some chips, this and that, small, small gifts. And I have provided them to, I have provided to county executive office, also police academy, uh, post office, and board of education. I am part of uh, ICNA, which is Islamic Circle of North America. It's a national organization. And this national organization motivate Muslims to uh, to play their role, their positive role in the society they are living in, and also educating non-Muslims about Islam and Muslims as well. I'm also part of uh, Poor People Campaign, which is a national movement, and this national movement is focusing on five injustices happening in this country. One is systemic racism, number two is poverty, number three is ecological devastation, militarism, and distorted moral narrative of religious nationalism. Why we have created, um, call a, created a project called Council for Social Justice, CSJ. Council for Social Justice is available for Muslims, non-Muslims, regardless of their race, color, and religion. If there is any injustice happen, they can reach this project and we can do our best to help them 
to stand by them. My name is uh, Farooq Ahmed Khan. I'm originally from Kashmir. Uh, however, I've been in Long Island in Jericho for the last 52 years. My professional life was as a physician and I did a fair amount of work and research and teaching and so on. However, over the last 20-25 years, I noticed that there was a great need. I'm a Muslim by, by faith uh, and our our faith was not being depicted in a proper manner, as far as I was concerned. That led to the beginning in 1992 of what we call American Muslims and Jews in Dialogue. And we collaborated with uh, Rabbi Jerome Davidson in Temple Beth Hill in Great Neck. And we were one of the first groups to launch an interfaith conversation on a formal basis. And then came 9-11, which was a disaster, a big terror attack, and of course that was a huge setback for the community at large. Bad people in every faith, they can't blame the whole faith for the attacks of terrorism. And during that time I was the spokesperson for the Islamic Center of Long Island, so we started a number of initiatives with the elder hostelers, with churches, with synagogues, they would come to the mosque, we would go to their places and address some core questions which were on the minds of our neighbors and of our people uh, in the larger community. And that led to the establishment of the Interfaith Institute of Long Island in 2015, of which I'm the chairman now. And that basically is my focus, expanding and breaking down barriers, explaining the tenets of the faith, understanding other faiths, through programs, through discussions, through Zooms, through personal meetings, uh, celebrating holidays together, and learning. Uh, in, this year was interesting. We had Passover, Easter, and Ramadan at the same weekend. So it was a great opportunity to interact and meet people and uh, introduce ourselves. So that's my passion, basically. Just to talk about a few months ago, uh, Ben Rifkin, a board member of the Interfaith Institute, organized a series of programs on life cycle events. What happens when a child is born? What do the Christians do? What do the Jews do? What do the Muslims do? What do the Hindus do? What do the Sikhs do? So we had that uh, is hour long session. Fascinating. It's all on the website. That's one of the beauties nowadays. We can record these events and share them with the wider audience. One of our board members, Sahar, she is working on developing a formal program for the schools. Uh, which will be hopefully part of their curriculums so that the kids, in, as soon as they get out of primary school, will be exposed to uh, the different faiths that exist on Long Island. There are 12 different faiths uh, practiced on Long Island. My name is Jeremy Joseph. I'm not from Long Island. I'm from Houston, Texas, and just through a roundabout way, made my way here about 10 years ago. I moved here by choice. So right now I'm living in Hicksville, which is where I've been for most of the last 10 years. My home base where I do most of my advocacy is through Nassau Democratic Socialists of America. And then alongside that, I've also been involved with Long Island United to transform policing and community safety. And so between those two groups, I've uh, been happy to say I've been doing work in a lot of different areas with Nassau DSA. One of the main things uh, we've been pushing for is the New York Health Act. This is a public health care system that would extend, uh, extend a health care system to everyone in the state, whether you're employed or not, whether you're documented or not. Uh, health care is a human right. Another big thing we fought for is regarding economic justice. Uh, in New York State, the rich do not pay their fair share in taxes, and the middle class and those with low income, certainly, uh, we all suffer for it. Uh, whether it's a lack of funds in education or healthcare, transit, uh, and even resulting in the ludicrously high property taxes that 
everyone here rightfully complains about. There is a solution to that. All we have to do is just tax those billionaires their fair share. So I'll move on to LI United now. Our group was born out of the uh, unrest that happened after George Floyd's murder. And so we've sort of served as a, um, a group advocating for police reform and coming up with solutions for public safety uh, in our own communities, both in Nassau and Suffolk County. Right now, all of those things have kind of coalesced into me running as a candidate for political office. So I get to run on all of these things at once. As an activist, you're learning about a need in your area. You are doing your best to let your neighbors know about this need. Uh, you know, oftentimes many of them are affected by it directly and they're telling you about it. And you meet with your elected official and you know, the reality is you beg them to listen to you. We have activists who are more passionate and more knowledgeable about issues facing people here. And then we're left to make appeals to the empathy of someone who almost invariably does not care. They are in office because they've been driven there by ambition or careerist motivations. Uh, it's simply a stepping stone for them. Uh, they are exactly in the position of power they, where they should not be. Uh, and so just witnessing this over and over again, I just kind of got, you know, angry <laughs> at just the state of things. For me right now, personally, that means running for office expressly with the purpose of supporting all of our activist work on the island, uh, giving us, you know, a seat of power. So instead of someone, you know, begging for a seat at the table, you know, we should be owning that table. Recently, I have become quite vocal and active in the election process. And I polled most of my neighbors. They didn't have a clue who was representing them, what the issues were. And uh, they said, yeah, we vote for the president when the, the time comes, election comes. But as far as local issues, totally disconnected. So I was amazed. <laughs> <laughs> so many jokes about it actually and uh, I invited some to kind of uh, sign a petition for one of the candidates and uh, they said uh, well we'll sign it you say it we'll sign it I said are you are you what's your reg voter registration oh I don't know are you uh, did you vote for this or that I don't I don't remember I voted for president such and such for through four years ago election system in my view needs to be overhauled and uh, this super PACs and PACs, they're just twisting everything around. And a common guy needs to have a say in the matter. Now it's basically, if you got the money, you can get in. If you don't, forget it. My name is Joe Sackman, and I live in Hicksville, which is in the middle of Nassau County. And my family moved here when I was three, so it's been about 40 plus years that I've been here. Live in the same town, haven't moved, Just, you know, I like it here. Even with all our ups and downs that we may have on Long Island, I still, still love living here. My advocacy started off with campaign finance reform back in like 2015, 2016. Before that, I, wish, I, sh I could, could say like I was more of a citizen clicktivist. You know, click on everything, sign a petition, donate some money. I felt like I was doing a lot just doing that. And then the Bernie Sanders campaign kind of like, what is going on here? This man has 25,000 people at every rally and no one's covering this. And it seems that things are going in a weird direction. And at the same time, I started seeing a lot of things about campaign finance reform. And I joined this group called Wolfpack. It was a single issue, uh, trying to get a constitutional convention through Article 5 on campaign finance reform. And I volunteered and I learned about knocking on doors and phone banking and all the fun stuff you do when you volunteer for an organization like that. But it went from being a volunteer to an organizer and then into a state director, the community director, and then a national coordinator, 
and national coordinator led to being on their advisory council, which is sort of like the board of directors for Wolfpack. And I oversaw several states and including New York, uh, helped, you know, build the team here and all to try to amend the constitution one of the hardest things you can do. And that led me into getting involved more locally with Long Island Activists, which is where I am now. Long Island Activists is a steering committee. I've been on there for three terms. And that also got me in with uh, New York Progressive Action Network and our revolution. And all of that, uh, and what I'm working on now, I did run for office. So I ran for state assembly in 2020 uh, what a year to run because COVID and we did as best we could electorally. I I'm involved with uh, a couple of campaigns. Um, so there's Congressional District 3, Melanie DiRigo. I'm in her corner. She's a great candidate, working class candidate. Jeremy Joseph, who's running for state Senate. He happened to work on my campaign back in 2020. If you look at the, our leaders now, most of them are millionaires or multimillionaires. And where is the housewife from Long Island? Where is the teacher from Long Island sitting in Congress? They, they understand what's going on at the local level and they don't have any say. Kind of adopting the motto, you know, working class representation only for the working class. Working class should not be electing millionaires into office. They don't know what our needs are. They don't care. That's, I mean, it's kind of thing. It's kind of obvious the way things are going. Um, so we need to elect our own. My name is Serena Martin Ligori. I am from Kings Park, uh, Long Island, and I work here in Brentwood. I am a Long Island native, born and raised on the South Shore, now on the North Shore. My grandparents came from Puerto Rico to the Bronx, and then they came out to Long Island, and they bought a house right here in Brentwood. So it's sort of special, it feels full circle to be working in the same community where my grand father had his bicycle shop. My grandmother was super involved in um, voter rights. Originally, I had, of course, been incarcerated and thought, okay, I've got to shift things on Long Island. I've got to figure out a way to support people who've been in prison and jail, support their families, and think about how do we really empower people to see beyond a conviction. In my role here at New Hour, we're consistently trying to advocate for women behind bars. That's anything from, you know, making sure that women are able to get substance abuse services to making sure that moms who give birth in prisons or jails have the right to uh, use a breast pump, nurse their babies. Um, just basic reproductive health rights are so overlooked People are surprised to hear the, the ways in which women are disregarded, whether it be reproductive health, access to education around abortion, um, access to um, meaningful relationships with their children. We have so many women who are court involved and there's just so many barriers to ensuring that they get to see their kids. I just got a call the other day from a woman who is in her 50s, she's been in prison for 20 years, denied parole over and over and over. And she's a grandmother, she's got a master's degree, she spent 22 years in prison. There's such an uphill battle for elderly people to come home, especially if they've committed a serious crime. And she always says to me, you know, I'm just not that kid that I was. Not to take away from the crime, but um, or the harm done, but she's grown and changed so much. And at some point, you know, our penal system says, once you've served your sentence, you should be allowed to go home. She served her sentence plus extra time, and they're still not letting her go home. So we're advocating for, um, you know, for meaningful parole reform, for people who are in a space where it's 
where they, they would be a benefit to come home. I think all the time about all the women who have come through the prison and jail system and how it shrinks your identity instead of growing your identity, instead of making people see, wow, they've survived something that is just so painful. We're working on building a home for women to come home to. So many women are homeless after incarceration and living in really squalid conditions um, and in conditions that don't promote safety. You know, we helped a woman who came home from prison after 20 years to upstate New York and we sent her a food card. We sent her a bus ticket. Seems like a handout and yet it's really not. I think about a friend of mine who, she had an old car that belonged to her dad. I came home from prison, I didn't have a car. And she was like, you can, you can take the car. It was like, you know, a $1,500 car. It meant that I could get to work. It meant that I could get to my parole officer. It, it was like the, the lift I needed to get on my feet. And so those things matter. And um, it's very easy to overlook how much people need in terms of actual financial support. Um, and we do that here too. So anyone who donates, that money goes right to someone who needs it. So you ready? Yeah. Okay. okay, so what is your name? My name's Amanda Sweeney. Where on Long Island are you from and how many years have you been living here? I used to live and I've been living here for approximately 15 years. Eileen's Free Bodega is a fridge for the community to get fresh goods um, in a dignified way without having to go to a food bank. The fridges are open 24 seven. So anyone could, you know, drop off food and take food whenever. So there's no like stigma, stigma um, against, you know, or like, I guess like the fear of stigma um, from the community because everyone has the right to, to food. Honestly, like my goal is just to keep filling the fridges um, and just empowering people. And little by little, we're, um, you know, educating the community. We're having a know your rights for undocumented individuals um, next two weeks from now. Um, and we just hope to continue to provide these community outreach sources, uh, resources to the community to empower themselves. People come to us, um, they trust us, they come to us with their problems and it's, it's heavy stuff. It's, you know, like, I'm undocumented, I need work or I'm homeless and pregnant, where can I go? I'm undocumented, but my child is not, they're developmentally disabled. So we have, uh, I believe it's DD, DDA or SSI, sorry. Um, and the state is taking it away from us. Now they want us to repay it back, but it's like, why? Why are they doing that to you? You're entitled to that. Your child's entitled to that. Your child is a citizen. Someone in the community is really, really old, um, 88 years old, and he doesn't have adequate housing. And it's like, you know, what's going on? Like, why is this occurring? We have, you know, politicians going to galas and smiling for photo ops, but that's not what's going on inside the community. That's going inside the gala, right? And the people that we're taking care of is not invited to those galas due to classism and colorism. We don't have an agenda. Our agenda is to empower folks. We're building institutions. Um, everything that, that I'm doing, like, I learned through, you know, activists in the past, Black Panthers, right? They get like a bad rap. Obviously, we know that's not the case. Um, that's just, you know, propaganda pushed by politicians on both sides. The fridge is dedicated to Jacqueline Call. She was a little girl, seven-year-old indigenous uh, Mayan child that died in ICE custody. She's not the only child that died in ICE custody. This is not an isolated case. We just don't talk about it as society. We ignore it due to classism and colorism. Um, so we put her on the fridge because we want to educate folks. Uh, do you have the name of the artist as well? Uh, Jose Flores. Um, he's from Port Washington and he does like a lot of um, decolonization, um, resistance art. They also painted the other fridge at the Consulate of El Salvador. The art represents society. Um, so if you look close enough, you could see that we are very political, even though food should not be a political issue.
My name is Shoshana Hershkowitz and I grew up in Plainview in Nassau County and I've been on Long Island my whole life other than the first nine months of my life when I was in Israel as a baby and when I went to college upstate in Potsdam and I live now in about five minutes um, east of here in South Setauket. I have been involved on a lot of issues, police reform with you, environmental issues with the Brookhaven Landfill Group. I've worked on health care, both trying to preserve the ACA for the people who live in this district, as well as with the New York Health Act. I've worked on immigration with some of the folks that are here, like Angel Rivas out east, and gun safety, which was actually the very first issue that I was engaged in. I took my first teaching job right after Columbine. so. That was something that really resonated with me and having to do things like lockdown drills and sheltering drills as a young teacher. So gun safety was definitely a big issue. Right now I'm working for Citizen Action of New York and I'm working on education and child care policy. So the things that I'm, I'm working on are one, the expansion of child care subsidies for low and middle income families across the state and trying to make sure that immigrant families, undocumented families aren't left out of that. Also. It's two-pronged. One is this bill called Solutions Not Suspensions, trying to create more of a restorative justice program in our schools so that way we don't start that criminalization of young people, particularly black and brown kids, at you know the kindergarten age, which is where it's starting. And also working quite a bit on um, foundation aid, making sure that schools are being funded and they're spending the money in a, in a way that benefits kids. and looking quite a bit at this really hyper-local politics with school board races and diversity, equity, and inclusion, not only where I live, but also across the state, trying to make sure that, you know, members of Citizen Action are running for school board so we get people who have the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and um, restorative justice serving on school boards. You didn't mention Suffolk Progressives. So I don't know if you wanted to mention Oh, that. yeah. Yeah, I guess because I was thinking issues, but yeah, I've, I founded Suffolk Progressives in 2017, mostly because I, you know, I had asked and reached out to the Democratic Party around here on a bunch after this 2016 election, and wasn't getting anything in return. wasn't getting a like, okay, here's what we're doing, and here's how we're bringing people in, and so I just sort of impulsively, you know, was sitting at my kitchen table with my laptop and was like. Let's just start a group for me and my friends so we can talk about this. And then it just kind of blew up. The big thing I thought was that it was about Trump and the biggest discovery has been that it wasn't really about Trump at all. <laughs> but it was about what happened that led to him and how we avoid ever, how we fix those things so we don't get another Trump. Because if we don't fix those things, it's inevitable. My name is Craig Moore. Um, I'm from Quorum, New York. I grew up in uh, the Bronx. I lived in, um, I grew up in the city. I'm a city boy. I moved out to Long Island in 1993. My family's been on Long Island for many years. I've been out here ever since. I grew up out here. Um, I went to school out here. I went to high school out here. I worked out here. I am everywhere in the community. Um, I am wherever I need to be in the community. Um, I see a lot of disparities um, on Long Island. Years ago, you used to come out here and be able to make a living. Mm. It's changed a lot. You can make a living out here, but also there's a lot of things that hinder you from making a living, depending on your background, you know, having transportation. So I advocate for transportation, that's a big issue. I try to advocate for anyone that needs someone to speak up for them, because the systems out here are so rigid and so tight that if you're not in with a certain crowd or if you don't know a certain person, you can't get anything done. The politicians kind of they act as if they're part of um, their concern. The majority of them act as if they're concerned, but the majority of them are just trying to stay in office. Or they're trying to keep the status quo on either side, any way you look at it. So I tend to try to speak up for people that can't speak up for themselves. And that's, how, that's my main goal. Right now, we're focused on the 50A. A lot of these police departments have a history of racial bias, and that's what we're starting to look at. They feel that they don't have to follow the rules. They get to set the rules. They get to dictate. The strong PBAs out here run the show, and it's unfair. We're also looking for a clean slate. It's one of our biggest issues. The clean slate, again, goes back to the law enforcement, industrial complex, multiplex, whatever you want to call it, that's what I call it. They have a hold on people. Three years misdemeanor, you can't. You haven't committed a crime, you made a mistake, meanwhile, it's stopping you from getting a job. It's stopping our economic recovery. 
seven years a felon. If you haven't committed a crime and you paid your debt to society and you're currently not on parole, why do you need to have this stigma still hanging over you? We can't grow as a nation if we keep everybody locked up in prison. You're talking almost 2.5 million people. 2.5 million people in the state of New York alone could instantly be able to go and apply for jobs and not have to look over their head and have to worry about a background check. It's about us being fair. It is, it's about us having empathy and compassion. And I think that the people in the county of Suffolk and Nassau have it, but we have to stick together and we have to fight back because there's a strong opposition and they're, they're small and minority-wise. The, the minority of them are small, but they have a lot of money. So my name is Rebecca Dolber, although I recently got married, so I'm now Rebecca Ray, <laughs> but I'm known mostly as Rebecca Dolber. Um, I grew up on Long Island, right uh, in the next town over in East Mariches. I was here till I was 18, and then I left for about 10 years, and then I came back because there was um, an incredible opportunity to live right on the bay. So I stayed there for another 10 years, and now my wife and I just bought a house out in East Mariches again. I run the East End Action Network. I went to the Women's March. And one of the things they said that we could do was to go home and just find other like-minded people and start a group. So I was like, okay, that's a nice tangible action. I can go ahead and do that. So uh, what I did was I just contacted the people that I knew also went to the Women's March. Some of them I actually knew and some of them I just knew tangentially. And before I knew it, I had, you know, 40 people in a living room week after week religiously. That has called down over the years, as I'm sure other people have experienced. But those early days were something magical. Our main objective is action. We want to encourage people to do, um, so whatever that means for them. I want to encourage uh, a space for people to come with their ideas and to bring their strengths and offer a community of support so that together we can get things done. Our members right now are really jazzed about Melanie Dorigo. Uh, I do want to say though that we, um, we don't, as a group, endorse candidates, something that we decided on really early because we didn't we didn't want to alienate anyone. We're involved with different organizations locally, like Let New York Vote. Uh, we have a lot of um, overlap with them, and um, our members are focused on the New York Health Act as well. The New York Health Act is single-payer health care. Most Long Island representatives are not supporting it. They give various reasons. How are you going to pay for it? You can do this, you can do that. And the reality is, is that it's going to save us money. As a matter of fact, there's an opportunity that if we do pass it, we could see savings in our property taxes, co-pays, no more, you know. Uh, you're not getting denied for uh, things that you need to have done. Kids don't have access to health care. Your grandparents are rationing their medications or they're going into poverty because they can't afford their medications. People are choosing to die. You know, they're not, they're not, it's not saying like they're committing suicide. They're just saying like, I can't afford this, but I have to eat. Profit over people seems to be the motto for our government. So what do you think the biggest issue facing Long Island is right now? The biggest one? There are many. Oh, that's such a big question. Among the many. I think uh, there is not one uh, biggest. There are two uh, issues Long Islanders facing. One is education system. And second is fair housing. These apartment buildings owned by private uh, landlords, they're not really taking care of their buildings. They are, they are just collecting the rent from renters. Prices. Prices, right? People can't afford houses. Personally, like I live with my family and my family, we all pay for the mortgage because if not, we wouldn't be able to afford a place to live. So if a middle class family can't afford to, you know, pay a mortgage, there's some issues, right? Biggest issue. It's really hard to say one big issue. Yeah, definitely climate is definitely one. In about 30 years, it's going to be about a foot and a half of uh, sea level rise. Housing is definitely another one. That means you might see a lot of the South Shore, parts of the North Shore, gone. Communities, gone. If, if, you, if you ask 
any Long Islander on the street what their biggest issue is, they'll tell you property taxes. Uh, and so I don't want to discount that. How do we not invest so much money in our police and instead invest that money in housing, in after-school programming, in support for mental health crisis. How can folks, you know, fight uh, institutional racism or even be aware of it if they're just trying to survive and keep a roof over their head and food on the table for their kids? The immediate answer is, is that there, there are so many people on this island who are in need right now. So I think that we, you can never forget that. They're suffering right now as we're doing this video. Um, there's food insecurity, there's housing insecurity, and those things need to be addressed on the daily. The gap between the haves and the have-nots is huge. You cannot have, build a home here unless you already have equity here through your family. My kids would not be able to afford housing now in Long Island. That's a big issue. I would say Long Island is fated to turn into a retirement community, but retirees, they can't even live in the homes that they've bought because they can't afford the property taxes. So who's left to live on Long Island? I know there's some people like, well, you know, I've always had it okay and I'm all right now, but I've talked to people who are retiring who have to go into reverse mortgages. So they spent their entire life working, basically saving for their retirement, and then pretty much going to lose their home. I have a follow-up question. All right. Because you started it by saying if you ask any Long Islander on the street what they would say. Yeah. Do you feel the same way? Do I feel the same way? Corporate greed is killing America. Capitalism is killing America. Um, there's homeless folks down the block that live in, in bus stops. And, you know, people ignore them, but they're humans. Fundamentally, you know, the island does not support the, the middle class. And, or rather the working class. And, and by working class, you know, that, that can conjure up many images, but by that I mean, if you go to work every day, you're working class. Uh, so this is, you know, I'm talking, you know, 95% of people. Working class families, middle class families, um, are being hyper-partisanized, if I can use that word, partisanized. Um, we are, we are, being turned against each other and for someone's benefit, not ours. Freedom is, is going beyond limits in this country, but at the same time, these, this freedom is abused by a lot of people. So they exploit, they manipulate, they misguide it, and they provide misinformation. I think that the bigger overarching issue that we're facing as Long Islanders and frankly, as a country, is this um, lack of community we have with our neighbors and people who disagree with us, frankly. The more that we fight with one another, the farther we get from one another. And what I know for sure is, is that the, there is purposeful vitriol on both ends to keep us from speaking to one another. And while we're over here fighting on Facebook with our neighbor, on message boards, they are over here just wreaking havoc. I think that's the biggest issue is that we have to come together, realize that as working class people, and I consider anybody working class who's got a boss, who goes in and, and clocks in and gets a wage, whether you're salaried or you're, you know, you're getting $15 an hour or less, you know, you're, you're working class and we're all struggling, you know and we've got to come together because we are the majority. And uh, what do you think the biggest issue facing Long Island is? Segregation. You know, I think it all comes back to the fact that we don't ever see people or rarely see people who are different than we are who have come from a different walk of life and we're not learning about it in our schools. I think it's the segregation or it, I don't know and that's not that sounds like a really politically charged word, but I think it's the separation. The biggest issue is the segregation. It's the public school education system. It's the good old boys club. And they try to deny it, but it's there. We know it's there. You know it's there. You know, one of the programs we held 
as part of the Interfaith Institute was um, slavery on Long Island. This was done by Stony Brook uh, students, a project, and we had one of the students present. And when she ended up her presentation, she realized, she stated that I have re relearned my history. What they taught me is not true. What happened was awful. And she dug out a piece of paper someplace from one of the towns where it was stated there that uh, cheese was priced higher than a slave, something like that. And she showed it to us. She said, so we have basically, kind of, I have relearned the, the mistakes that were made. And the effect of that is that we are one of the most segregated uh, parts of uh, suburbs in the United States, which reflects in the school district, which reflects in housing, and uh, which reflects in anti-this, anti-that. And that, I think, is a big issue. People don't like to talk about it, but it is an issue, and it has ramifications in healthcare. It has ramifications in housing. It has ramifications in jobs. Everywhere. Our criminal justice system is a disaster. Why should the country like the United States have the highest number of incarcerated individuals? Makes no sense. But when you look back at it, it, uh, it basically boils down to the issues of slavery. The fact that I didn't really get that until the last few years tells you how bad segregation is. There is such a segregation of our communities into pockets of people with the same amount of money, the same lifestyle, the same ethnicity, and it's destroying us. When I got hired to teach and someone said, oh, you're working in a good school district, like it never occurred to me to question that because that was just what I'd heard my whole life. And when I moved to Three Villages, like, oh, that's a good school district. And again, I was like, what does that mean? And I never really sat with that until the last really the last few years, and I think that that's a testament to segregation and to privilege. We need to really focus in changing history and being more united and um, uplifting each other more. I think um, there is still a lot of prejudice, there's still a lot of um, discrimination, and a lot of times we don't even realize that we're participating in perpetuating those issues. And um, I have seen it more often um, in the, you know, I would say in the, in the past year or two than what I realized was happening. And it's, it's an eye opener and it's very sad. I, I really feel hopeful that we're able to bring about change but in order to do so, each one of us has to really be held accountable and take responsibility. Like, I know a lot of people feel that, you know, I'm not to blame for what happened in the past or what my parents did. But what I say is that by me acknowledging that someone did something that wasn't right, that, that hurt somebody else, is not me saying that I did it. It's simply stepping up and, and building that connection and telling those around us, I hear you, I feel you, I, you know, I respect you, and I'm doing my part to fix this problem. It's time to really start facing the fact that segregation is going to hold us back, and this is New York, and we can't allow that. We can't allow it. We have to speak. And I'm relying on the young folks, I'm relying on the youth to get involved, because when they hear your voice, that's when they're listening, because there are a lot of people that are behind you and want to do it, but they're afraid. I think a lot about sort of the ways in which the culture of Long Islanders is one that allows for racism and, and bias to sort of percolate under the sort of veil of jest and jokes and, and making fun or tongue in cheek. And, and the truth is that we're doing so much damage and we have to do better. Being a city kid, I lived in a lot of different places, but Long Island is beautiful. We got beaches, we got parks, we got, we have everything. We have things that other places don't have. The one thing we don't have is equality, equity. That's what the people in, the, in these communities want, in the poor communities want. The working poor, they're all working, everyone's working, but that's what segregating is stopping us in education, it's stopping us in law enforcement, 
It's stopping us in um, government, representation. Look at the redistricting lines. Come on. The census. I mean, look at it. Even in transportation. Certain neighborhoods, you got to wait two hours to get a bus. Certain other neighborhoods, you got to wait maybe 15 minutes for a bus. But meanwhile, that bus, those people in that community don't even use that bus line. So it, it comes down to really facing it and grappling and looking at ourselves in the mirror. Look at the man in the mirror because you're a part of it. You know, he, she, them, we are all a part of it. We have to take responsibility and stand up and not be afraid to speak our minds because those are the issues that's going to affect us for the next 20 or 30 years. Long Island is one of the most segregated communities, communities across the country. And I can only say that's intentional. And so it has to be intentional that we find ways to bridge that gap. We have to get out and do it actively. As activists, we have to step up in those communities and step in their faces and tell them it's not fair. And they're going to have to face it. And they're going to have to deal with it. You know, there's this whole idea that like either you're an activist or you're not doing anything. And it's just uh, at the detriment to, to everything. Um, I think that if, if you have an inclination to get involved and do something, that you can do something as little as, as going to vote if you've never voted before, or bring somebody who's never voted with you to go and vote. You can write, you don't have to write 100 postcards. You know, you can write five postcards. Kindness and compassion go a long way. Choose kindness, you know, if something resonates with you, really, really try to apply it into your everyday life. And let's just be grateful and, and learn from past experiences, learn from others, learn from our ancestors. Start simple, maybe start tutoring a child at the library. It's about doing little things in your own life with what little time I know everybody has to just contribute in some way. And I think that what you find is, is that once you start contributing a little bit, you wanna contribute more. You don't think you're gonna to wanna, to, but you do. As you start doing it, doors open up. People contact you, you contact them. Next thing you know, you're right where you need to be and you're making change and you're doing it. And the people in those communities that don't like it, they're gonna have nothing else but to deal with it. They either can get with you and help you or they can get out of your way. Take action in a meaningful way every day. And it doesn't have to be big things. It can be things like calling your legislators. It can be things like showing up at school board meetings and speaking up for DEI. I, you know, I think that it can be as small or as big as you want it to be. It can be writing letters to the editor, which is something I love to do. But I think it's about making sure that you're not passive about what's happening where we live. You know, find an issue you're passionate about. Find one you think you can contribute to. Um, Find some balance of this, and there is certainly an organization that would be a fit for you. And don't go there to spectate. Be there and be active. It takes a lot of people doing a lot of constant work to be effective. Doing nothing is how we got here, you know? And I think that there are a lot of really good human beings on Long Island. And I think that when we stay quiet is when racism and bigotry flourishes and you know i think that people people are scared especially right now to make themselves heard because they're scared of the social capital they may lose they're scared of you know making an acquaintance angry or being uncomfortable people are so scared to be uncomfortable and and i understand why because it it feels scary right now i think we need to start building bridges and connecting with one another um and question question everything. Across Long Island, there are some powerful people who have such great missions and who are really dedicated to making sure we have a better community for our kids and grandkids and our, our generations to come. But it, it takes work. It's active work. And I think that that's what we have to keep pushing for. It's up to you. Everything that happens in the next 10 years, five years, down to one year, to two months. It's up to you. Take a stand, stand up. Um, let your voices be heard. Don't let the status quo keep getting away with it. Don't let the sins of our forefathers, our grandparents or parents, or our reluctances of some of our parents or our family or friends stop you. Basic needs are pretty much the same for everybody. Food, housing, shelter. That's a human need. 
And then you add on the religion on top of that and people get confused. And when you peel the layers of the onion, you realize that everybody's saying the same thing. As a Muslim, I practice Islam. And Islam means submit to God, fully submission. And Islam means also peace. It means I have to be peaceful person. It means no one should expect from me any kind of harm, either verbally or physically. I have to be cooperative and I have to also, this is my right. If I see something wrong, I have to stand up, arise. I have to gather people, organize them, and then uh, talk about whatever injustice is happening in front of my eyes, in my town, on my street, in my city, or in my county or state. You have to think about who you are, because I'm a white guy, right? I live in suburbia, I'm a white guy. And I live in a system that has benefited me in some way, even if I didn't realize it. And the reality is, is that there's a lot of people that this system oppresses. So make sure that you're making space for them and that you, and you are not, um, you're not part of that oppression. Some doors were open to me and people were more willing to listen to me because of who I, you know, physically, you know, am and in, in, in the place of society that I live in, which is pretty much white supremacist. And I think as you, you go along, you learn that and you realize, well, you know, I also need to make justice part of whatever I do. So and that may sound sort of aspirational to people and maybe I'm sounding way off to some others, but that is the reality. That is a reality. For us to move forward as a society, whatever we're doing, we have to include justice and starting from a place of human dignity. Preamble rumbling thunder from a wealthy mob of men who did declare they had enough of bluffing king commanding them he would pray on their pay till the day they said nay go to war blood would pour break away what a day when they won but no fun the battle just begun we're still fighting the fascists for freedom 100 years later an amendment said free those souls were sold to hypocrites who claim supremacy another battle would rattle the heart of the nation Two centuries later, still a raging conflagration Separation, segregation, not a drop of reparation And they freak if you speak, disagree, take a knee Everybody freeze for the national anthem Get down on your knees for the national anthem It's a disease, a catastrophe Our allegiance under God over democracy I still believe we'll free the dream of the old red, white, and blue But I guess nothing works the way it's supposed to your mother and your daughter and your sister and your auntie see the shards of the glass ceilings they keep shattering supplanted every time by the crime of their personal choices shut up white man let them raise their voices get out of their way man more than equally pay them they walk circles around you lazy every day every way man Why do you believe a TV shouting out of you? Why do you always need a daddy man to tell you what to do? All this cognitive dissonance, there's no critical thinking. The school, the church, the media, what started your brain shrinking? How I wish I could shake you awake from your sleep. Another sheep on the heap, waging rage. What a creep, yeah, you can't spell patriot without the riot. Can't sell nationalism, boy, unless you'll buy it. It's a damn shame, and the ones to blame are playing chess. The US just one piece of the game. I still believe we'll flip the board, although I'm sure they'll sue But I guess nothing works the way it's supposed to 
I'm going down to Washington, I'm running for the seat. Yeah, I had enough of nothing, more than nothing on repeat. Yeah, I'm bringing home my savvy and my introspective view. And they'll shoot me on the mall before somebody can yell, Jew, and I'll laugh as I fall and accept my bloody christening. You get freedom of speech as long as nobody is listening. Yeah, you can have a creed experiment without some failure But question the wrong faction and they're bound to jail you Toss you off a roof and make it look like you goofed What's the truth? So aloof, slow to show us the proof And by the time it shines through your ADD's got you It's you, it's you, it's you It doesn't work the way it's supposed to That's it? Is that it? That's all? <laughs> Great!